tonight on CBC Vancouver News. I think it's an interesting approach to, to do it in schools. A new campaign in BC schools to ensure more children are immunized against measles. Plus, the officer here ticketed my client for doing something that was in fact not unlawful. Why a BC judge has thrown out a regularly issued ticket for distracted driving also. I think yesterday I did about 17, 17 full of these. Hashtag trash tag the global movement on social media to pick up garbage. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. BC is boosting its push to get kids vaccinated. The province will launch a three-month immunization program after spring break that will move clinics right into schools. But as our Tanya Fletcher is finding out tonight, some say the campaign doesn't go far enough, while others think it goes too far. We have a significant number of people who are not immunized. BC's health minister announces an immunization blitz as new numbers show a drop-off in vaccination rates last year. 82% of seven-year-olds had their measles shots in 2018. That's down from nearly 90% the year before. The goal is to get that number all the way up to 95%. The government plans to do that with its new measles immunization catch-up program. It'll run from April to June with the province spending $3 million to boost its supply of vaccines. And just to put this in context, in the average year, we uh, in British Columbia get about 120,000 doses of uh, a vaccine. This year, we are going to be adding that, essentially doubling that amount to support these campaigns. Health authorities will set up special clinics at community centres this spring and mobile units will circulate through certain regions of B.C. Public health nurses will also go into schools province-wide to make sure measles vaccines are made available to every student. It's an initiative being welcomed by many. I think it's an interesting approach to, to do it in schools. I kind of find it surprising that the schools allow unvaccinated kids to go in the first place. But some say the province is interfering where it shouldn't. I'm very much a believer that people should be able to make their own choice about vaccinations and I would like to keep uh, the government out of it. He has three young children and says parents should not be forced into a decision either way. I've chosen for sure to delay the vaccination process with my kids. Um, but again, I'm not against, um, but I am a big believer in doing your research. Yet this online petition shows nearly 50,000 signatures in support of mandatory immunizations. The Maple Ridge mom behind the push says kids should have to be vaccinated before they can be enrolled in public school. The province has said it has no plans to force parents to immunize their children. Instead, the province is moving forward with plans for mandatory vaccination reporting this fall. The registry will blanket all public and private schools in B.C. and will be in place for the start of the next school year in September. Tanya Fletcher, CBC News, Vancouver. The coffee cup holder, maybe the passenger seat. Well, that's where many of us stick our cell phones when we drive. And for doing that, many drivers have been slapped with distracted driving tickets. But now, as the CBC's Mickey Cowan reports, a ruling from a B.C. Supreme Court judge could pave the way for appeals and ticket disputes. When it comes to distracted driving laws, the rules can still be a bit hazy. Why are you driving with the phone with the steering hand like that? I was under my leg. He said if I was in my pocket, it'd be fine. I think it's okay to have it right in your reach or in view because you're not touching it. You're not, you're not using it, so why, why should they give you crap for it, right? Plenty of drivers have been ticketed for having a cell phone on the passenger seat while driving or even in the cup holder. I've dealt with dozens of those cases, and police officers frequently issue those tickets, particularly in Vancouver. But getting ticketed for a loose cell phone in the vehicle could soon be no more after a recent court case. The driver had his cell phone wedged between the folds of the passenger seat. The driver was convicted of using an electronic device while operating a motor vehicle. But now an appeal judge has overruled that, deciding that the mere presence of a cell phone in the vision of the driver is not enough for a conviction. It could set a huge precedent for how tickets are issued. There are probably lots of tickets that have already been issued that are waiting in the wings to be adjudicated that are now going to be decided by this case. But will it mean changes for those who dole out the fines? Vancouver police aren't making any promises just yet. Well, right now we're, we're aware of what uh, the decision that was made in the court and we're just uh, reviewing the decision. Uh, but we are happy with it because it sets uh, some guidelines for not just us but police officers uh, throughout the province. 
Lee says anyone ticketed for having a loose cell phone can now have grounds to challenge their conviction from the last 30 days, dispute it in traffic court, or file an appeal. Mickey Cowan, CBC News, Vancouver. Vancouver police want you to know about another scam targeting seniors. Thieves got away with a lot of money, and investigators say the victims were defrauded over the phone. CBC News at 11 host Dan Burrett joins us now live. And Dan, this wasn't your average phone scam. No, uh, not your average take. Mike, Vancouver police say five seniors were duped out of more than $3 million. Here's how they did it. Fraudsters call the person on a landline pretending to be a jewelry store owner or a cop. They say the senior's credit card has been used to buy something big and they need to help to look into it. Then they ask the senior to hang up and call their bank or 911 right away. Here's the rub though. The fraudster stays on the line because on some landlines, if the person who called first doesn't hang up, the lines stay connected. So when the senior goes to call 911 or their bank, the fraudster is still on the line. They will in fact play a fake dial tone, then pretend to be a cop or that bank employee, and then through several back and forth calls, persuade the victim to transfer a lot of money to overseas accounts. We want you to be aware that if you're using a landline, that fraudsters are asking you to call the bank or the police and are remaining on the line after you hang up. There is that potential for that person to be on the other line. Thankfully, police have recovered two and a half million dollars in two cases, but that still leaves hundreds of thousands of dollars stolen, Mike. Okay, Dan, so what can people do to protect themselves? Well, it's all relatively simple stuff. Take a look at this. First, if you're using a landline phone, make sure it's disconnected once you hang up a call. Another option, and many more of us are doing this, just use a cell phone, as many of us are. If you're unsure or don't trust the person on the other end of the line, just hang up. And if you think you have been scammed, call Vancouver Police on their legitimate number, 604-717-0503. And outside Vancouver, call your local police department. Keep in mind, police think there could be more victims out there because people are embarrassed when they've been scammed. Mike. Dan Burrett reporting live tonight. Thanks. A sheriff's deputy in Washington state is dead and another officer in hospital after a traffic stop turned into a shootout. Kittitas County Deputy Ryan Thompson was killed. Thompson and another officer were trying to stop a car that was driving erratically when the driver tried to escape. After a short chase, the driver got out of the car and started shooting at the officers who returned fire. 42-year-old Thompson was hit and later pronounced dead in hospital. Last night was the worst incident in my 45 plus years in law enforcement and something that a sheriff or police chief wishes would never ever happen during their watch. Our community has a very heavy heart today, and last night we lost one of our finest. Thompson was married with three children. The other officer involved was shot in the leg. He is expected to recover. The suspect, who's not been identified, was taken to hospital with a gunshot wound where they died. It's not clear why they fled from police. Well, staff shortages for paramedics and ambulance dispatchers are at unprecedented levels. Those shortages are impacting services right across the province. During last week's night shift, the Union for Ambulance Workers says anywhere from 25 to 40 paramedic units were out of service across the Sea to Sky, Lower Mainland, and Fraser Valley areas. That's up to 49% of the total units available. BC Emergency Health Services says it's working to schedule more staff. However, a recent survey of paramedics and dispatchers in BC found 81% of do not think the BC EHS monitors fatigue and burnout. <music> Johanna Wagstaff is here, spring officially here as well, and your streak continues. It does, day four of record-breaking temperatures across the south coast. And it is a gorgeous evening to be uh, talking to you from outside the studio. Blue skies, lots of people taking their time strolling home or to the game. It certainly feels more like summer than spring. I want to show you the records that we set across the south coast today. Unofficially, uh, we might see these numbers fluctuate a little bit. Environment Canada will likely put out an official posting tomorrow. Uh, but look at these numbers. High teens, low 20s once again across the board. Uh, for the island, I think this was your warmest day, although Tufino didn't quite make that 24 today. Uh, West Vancouver at a 21. 
and even uh, v Vancouver, we might end up breaking some local records uh, by the time we hit the next couple of hours. Temperatures still mild as I uh, take you through the currents. 13 at YVR, 20s out towards the valley and hanging on to a 17 at Victoria Airport as well. Seasonals? around 11 for this time of the year, so we remain above and in the blue thanks to this high pressure system. Uh, this is ushering the warmer all the way across BC up into the Yukon, the Northwest Territories, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba, all sharing in this big ridge of high pressure. We get one more day. So taking you down to a six tonight, you'll note that it's a milder start to your Thursday than the past couple of mornings, although the uh, jump to double digits has been very quick. A slightly cooler, maybe by a degree tomorrow, but uh, Mike, I will take you through to the end of the week showers that are coming, coming up. All right, thank you. And if you are watching us live on Facebook or YouTube, Johanna's gonna be answering your questions live during the upcoming commercial break. This weather update is brought to you by Remax. What's your home worth? Find out with our instant valuation tool at Remax.ca. Well, it's a worldwide social media campaign that's encouraging people to collect garbage. And hashtag trash tag is picking up momentum. The CBC's Rafferty Baker talked to a woman along Vancouver's Arbutus Greenway who wasn't even aware of the campaign, but has spent the past couple of days trying to make her city a cleaner place. There's so much stuff even just back there that I'm not going to be able to get to. Kate Gardner works her way through a gnarly bush to grab some litter. Even in the context of picking up trash, this is the less glamorous part of her effort. Gardner, a local student, has spent the better part of the last two days doing this. I think yesterday I did about 17, 17 full of these. That was Monday's haul. On Tuesday, she counted 12 more shopping bags full of litter all from a stretch of Vancouver's relatively new Arbutus Greenway. Gardner posted some of her bags on Reddit, and she quickly got close to 200,000 views and well over 5,000 upvotes. She wasn't aware of the trash tag hashtag, but others quickly made the connection to the global movement to collect garbage from beaches, parks, and streets. Passersby have noticed Gardner's efforts too. I have to say that I'm thrilled that she's doing that because that's a wonderful thing to do. The litter generally in the city now is worse than it's ever been. So why does Gardner do this? She says she didn't post her efforts to shame litter bugs. She just enjoys being outside and it's a chance to try to lead by example and encourage others to spend some of their leisure time in the sun picking up litter. Uh, you get a bit of a tan, you get some fresh air. It's pretty fun, honestly, it's pretty gratifying. Like even just walking what I did yesterday and seeing just how much better it is. Gardner says she's noticed many of the bins the city has provided along the trail are often overfilled, making it more difficult for people to responsibly dispose of their garbage. People are only going to use them if there's space in them. You can't put trash in a full bin, so uh, I don't know. I think more bins would be a good idea, especially, especially in the seated areas. Gardner says she would like everyone to do their part, whether it's properly throwing away cigarette butts, disposable cups and plastic, or helping to make the city a cleaner, better place. But mostly, she seems to just enjoy spending the time outside doing her part. Rafferty Baker, CBC News, Vancouver. And if you want to get your friends and family involved in the trash tag movement, you can share that story of Rafferty's with them. Follow us on Twitter at CBC News BC and subscribe to our YouTube page at CBC Vancouver. You can also let us know what you think about the major stories of the day by watching us online. This newscast is streaming live and on demand every night on Facebook, YouTube, and on our website, cbc.ca slash bc. Well, what does killing tens of thousands of sea urchins off the BC coast have to do with reconciliation? Coming up, the unique partnerships between governments and First Nations on Haida Gwaii. Hello everyone, thanks for joining me on YouTube and Facebook Live. I'm meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff here to answer your questions all things spring as we officially get through the spring equinox that happened at 2.58 p.m. Pacific time today. Uh, if you've got any questions, uh, send them over. I've got my producer sending them my way and you've already loaded up some good questions. So let's see how many we can get through during this commercial break. Rocco on YouTube, how do meteorologists predict the weather? Let's see if I can do this in a couple sentences. Basically, we take all of the current conditions and observations we can get on what's going on in the weather right now 
run it through advanced computer models based on equations of how the atmosphere changes through time, and then we end up with a snapshot of what things look like in the future. That's in a nutshell. Uh, from Tammy on YouTube, what is the West Coast, why is the West Coast experiencing this extreme weather? Yeah, we really have seen some extremes in the past uh, few weeks, going from well below to well above seasonal. This warmth we're experiencing right now is because this huge ridge of high pressure is centered over the BC interior and it's ushering in uh, basically an air mass from California. We get a clockwise motion around a high pressure system. So when it's situated in the right place, it can act sort of as a conveyor belt for warmer air. And because you get sinking air associated with high pressure, that keeps clouds from forming, which is often why we get warm and clear uh, together at the same time. Uh, again, if you're just joining us on YouTube or Facebook, uh, these are great questions. Lee, are we in for a longer heat wave this summer uh, from Facebook? That's a tough one to say. Uh, our trends have been that uh, a warming climate has meant for BC. Our summers are starting earlier. They're longer, hotter, and drier. And we're seeing a shift in season. That has certainly been the story the past few summers. Early indications are that we are looking at an above seasonal uh, summer based on a, a lingering El Nino, historical events, climate change, and uh, the long range uh, models. So unfortunately, uh, warmer than normal may be in the cards. Uh, Tammy on YouTube, uh, the worm moon. Full moon, spring equinox, what is the best time to view it? We're actually going to be talking about this later on in our show. But yes, tonight is not only a full moon, it's a super moon. Uh, so you can see the sun, I think it's 12% brighter and 14% larger. Uh, best time to view it, and we've got perfect conditions out here on the West Coast, is just after the sun sets and the moon rises, it'll actually look the biggest and the most red when it's just above the horizon. This is our last super moon of 2019. It seems like we've had a lot. I think this has been a big year. And again, we'll have uh, more on that later on in the show. Uh, last question. Uh, over the two summers, these big blocking high pressure systems are more frequent. Is this due to climate change? Unfortunately, we are seeing uh, trends that indicate these longer, hotter, drier summers, especially for the West Coast. We'll be watching that very closely as we turn the corner into the next season. I'll send you back to the show and I'll see you later. The idea of cities engaging in reconciliation is still new in most of British Columbia. But on Haida Gwaii, where the indigenous and non-indigenous population is roughly the same, it's been part of life for decades. Our Justin McElroy reports on the lessons they have for the rest of the province. In some municipalities, reconciliation is an abstract concept, not so in Haida Gwaii. Today we're in Port Clements, where an industrial community is learning to change with the times. Jalen Edenshaw was the lead carver of a legacy poll celebrating one of the first agreements with the Canadian government. This is going to be part of a transformation mask. The bird's going to be on the outside and they'll open up into this guy. In the years since, there's been plenty of new protocols and frameworks. But he says one of the biggest changes came from the mayor of Port Clements in 2004 in a lawsuit that enshrined the need for government to meaningfully consult on resource issues. Sort of ag agreed with us saying, you know, hi to control of the forests would be better than, than uh, crown control. And that's coming from like a, a logging community. You know, I think it's a good step. Municipalities and band councils have separate land and jurisdiction, but have protocols in place. Port Clements once prioritized logging above all else. Now it prioritizes its agreements with the Haida. It's been good as a working relationship to get on to a more formal reconciliation agreement. Doggart's town is working on a joint tech strategy with the Haida. Masset and Old Masset share a water and sewage agreement. Haida names have been added to bridges and schools. It's, it's moving more and more, but again, it, this is just the beginning. It's just that we're figuring this relationship and really what it entails. Queen Charlotte's mayor was adopted into the Haida and says even with the head start on the rest of BC, they have a long way to go. But we are just at the beginning stage. Like this is literally 15 years is nothing. Reconciliation doesn't mean everyone agrees all the time. It's got its challenges of just understanding and I think it boils down to actually a Haida term, which I can't pronounce properly, but it means respect. There's an irony in those comments. 
but what's indisputable are the partnerships, big and small, that are a direct result of the years of work put into reconciliation. What's your take up? 32. Uh, what's 3150? You know, the Haida Nation's worked really hard over the last couple decades on building some of these relationships, and we're just starting to see it alive out on the grounds now. The Haida are in the midst of a project culling the sea urchin population, which flourished after sea otters were nearly hunted to extinction. That caused harm to kelp, vital to aquatic biodiversity. Now, in a partnership with Parks Canada, they're working to reverse centuries of damage. So it's just this big um, collaboration between uh, people that may not see eye to eye all the time, but people that are working together towards a common goal. And to me, that's one of the main parts of this project is trying to uh, work together and build trust. There were no sea urchins to be found on this particular dive, but sometimes the outcome on any one day is less important than the long-term process. Justin McElroy, CBC News, Haida Kwai. Federal Liberals were out today trying to promote their budget. Coming up, how they were upstaged by a member of their own caucus. Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. 
Attention all junior treasure hunters and adult assistants. During the last week of spring break, you can explore the city and discover hidden treasure in your own backyard. Win a limited edition CBC Vancouver lunchbox filled with secret items every day from March 25th to the 29th. All you have to do is unravel the clues on our Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram stories. Get all the details at cbc.ca slash treasure hunt. Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. So it's nice to have this clarification from the court and an indication that there is no uh, offense committed by a person who just has the phone loose in the vehicle. Being ticketed for distracted driving is getting a little bit harder. A BC Supreme Court judge has ruled that simply having a cell phone within sight of the driver isn't enough for a conviction. The point we want to make to parents and the school community uh, today is that immunization is an effective and very easy step to take. The province is launching a measles immunization program in BC schools starting next month. It's in preparation for mandatory vaccination status in the fall. Still myths abound when it comes to measles and vaccines. The CBC's Bethany Lindsay explains. Let's talk about the MMR vaccine for measles, mumps and rubella. There is so much false information out there. It's on Twitter, it's on Facebook, it's on YouTube, and it's really hard to know what to believe. So with some help from BC's Provincial Health Officer, Dr. Bonnie Henry, I'm going to try and debunk some myths. Number one. Does the MMR vaccine cause autism? I can say with complete confidence that the measles, mumps and rubella vaccine does not cause autism. This idea mostly comes from a fraudulent 1998 study by a guy named Andrew Wakefield. He faked his results and had a major conflict of interest. He allegedly wanted to start a business based on his findings. Now Wakefield lost his medical license because of this and the paper was retracted. Autism aside, the risk of side effects from the vaccine is pretty small, about one in a million. Number two, does the vaccine contain mercury? None of the childhood immunizations in Canada has ever contained thimerosal. People who spread false information about vaccines usually say it's thimerosal, a mercury-based preservative that causes autism in kids. But there's no thimerosal in the MMR shot and no evidence that it causes autism anyway. Number three, can you prevent the measles with vitamins? Vitamins are really important, but they don't prevent measles. The thing that prevents measles is immunization. Kids who have low levels of vitamin A do get sicker if they catch the measles, and Canada sends vitamin A pills to other countries in an attempt to prevent death from the measles. But that doesn't actually mean the vitamins prevent the disease. Number four, what about immunoglobulin? Can that prevent the measles? So immune globulin doesn't prevent you from getting sick, but if you've been exposed, it can help stimulate your immune system. It's what we call passive immunity. Immunoglobulin is made from blood plasma, and it's full of antibodies that protect against disease, but it's only useful in the short term, and if you've already been exposed to measles. Finally, number five, can recently vaccinated people shed the measles virus? The short answer is no, not for, uh, not for this virus or, or any others. This seems like a common misconception, but vaccinated people don't shed the measles virus. They can't get other people sick. And the virus that's in the vaccine is attenuated, which means it's been weakened until it's basically harmless. Hope that clears up a few things. Remember, getting a vaccine is the best way we know of to protect yourself against the measles. The federal finance minister was out trying to sell his new budget today. Bill Morneau is taking to the airwaves to promote his plan. We want to continue to make sure that we're fiscally responsible as we make investments in Canadians. Uh, my view is that we, we need to protect uh, a huge strength that we have in terms of our strong balance sheet. Morneau says Canada has a record low employment unemployment rate and he says the government is trying to help ease concerns about housing. But the Liberal government's effort to sell the budget is being upstaged by a lingering political controversy. Today, Liberal backbencher Selena Caesar Chavan suddenly quit the caucus to sit as an independent. And as our Katie Simpson explains, that's not only increasing pressure on the Prime Minister. 
The only thing the Prime Minister wants to talk about today is his new budget. But his agenda has been thrown right off track after an Ontario Liberal MP announced she's quitting the party. Selena Caesar Chavan didn't offer any hints about her decision when she went into caucus this morning. I'm going, so yeah. Okay, so how are you feeling? I'm yeah. good. Hours later, the Prime Minister announced she's leaving his team. I have uh, just been notified by my office that uh, uh, Selena Caesar Chavan has uh, decided to sit as an independent. I want to thank her for her uh, service uh, to the Liberal Party and to her constituents and wish her the best in her continued service to <laughs> constituents. Caesar Chavan accused the Prime Prime Minister of being hostile and angry with her when she told him last month that she didn't want to run again in the 2019 election. She went public after throwing her support behind Jody Wilson-Raybould and Jane Philpott in their criticism of the government over the handling of the SNC-Lavalin affair. I, I understand that there is a lot of people that, that supported me that were disappointed in you know, what I did um, uh, doing the interview that I did. Or questions the honorable leader of the opposition the opposition used question period to announce its plans to push for a new investigation into the controversy through the ethics committee the liberals hold the majority on that committee so the effort may not get very far that might be good enough for the conservatives who are doing everything they can to try to keep this story alive katie simpson cbc news ottawa Okay, back now to the federal budget, which has plenty of promises, but the big winner in this year's federal budget, cities. Cameron McIntosh now on a multi-billion dollar windfall meant to get infrastructure projects off the ground. Like most Canadian cities, the wish list in Winnipeg is long, expensive, and largely just trying to fix what's already broken. So getting an unexpected $40 million, the mayor gets a little excited. When I heard the number, I was... I think I, 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 there may have been some some language I won't use here, like you've got to be kidding me. Budget 2019 doubles municipal transfers from the federal gasoline tax fund, a one-time election year top-up of $2.2 billion. To it also comes with a direct dig from the federal finance minister. We've not been able to get as many projects done in some places, places like Ontario, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, New Brunswick. Read provinces with conservative governments. That got fingers pointing and spin churning, including this from Ontario's finance minister. Well, uh, certainly uh, the federal minister can uh, uh, continue to play political games. Not surprisingly, Toronto's mayor sees it differently. This represents an important recognition of the role that cities play in addressing the big national issues that residents expect us to address. I think the politics of this that really appeals to us is the federal government saying we believe in a direct relationship and partnership with local government. Now provinces may still have a role here. That $2.2 billion could actually become even more under programs for matching provincial and federal funds. I think this will help the, pro, uh, the municipalities actually leverage some of that money to get into uh, the, bigger, uh, the bigger pie of infrastructure. Bowman, who's at odds with Manitoba's government over road repairs, says Winnipeg's share will fill a $40 million shortfall. I want to hit the ground running as quickly as possible. Of course, for the Liberal government, the idea here is to get building and get people working well before the next federal election. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. 6.32 on this gorgeous Wednesday evening. There's a live shot of the harbour tonight. The North Shore Mountains in the background. Stunning. Spring is officially here, but will this amazing stretch of weather continue? Johanna's forecast is coming next.
This weather update is brought to you by your local REMAX agent. The experience, the tools, the know-how. That's the sign of a REMAX agent. Well, with warmer weather here, Avalanche mm -hmm. Canada is warning everyone to be wary of increased avalanche risk. Yes, yeah, so keep that in mind when we show you this next video about how quickly one can take you by surprise. And these skiers were waiting to head down the slopes in the Austrian Alps. The group was on a popular backcountry route when a ridge of snow suddenly collapsed beneath them. Wow. Mm. Yeah, the, sorry, I was distracted. That is great video. Uh, it is dramatic, but fortunately, no one was hurt. So that is some good news there. But yeah, a reminder of how quickly things can so get away quick. from you. Absolutely. Whoa. I know. Yeah, and we do have that widespread avalanche warning still in place for BC mm -hmm. and Alberta. It's tempting, but uh, definitely check mm -hmm. things out before you head out. Well, because it's kind of warm out still. Kind of warm out, mm -hmm. yeah. There's a lot going on today. So it's still spring break for many. Mm -hmm. Spring has officially sprung, yes. and tonight is a super moon. Oh, your super moon, right. Yeah, it's okay. a trifecta of sorts. It is a trifecta of meteorological <laughs> atmospheric happenings. I've got some great pictures uh, I want to show you. Actually coming out of uh, Lisbon, where they got, an, well, obviously, got to see the uh, super moon before us. Uh, but it will rise tonight in our neck of the woods. In fact, a best time to view it is when, uh, the, super, is when the sun is setting. So in the next hour or so, uh, you can watch that uh, moon rise above the horizon. And because it's on its closest approach during its uh, orbit around Earth, it'll appear 14% larger and 30% brighter. It's also known as the super worm moon for this time of the year. They always have different names. It feels like we've had nonstop super moons. This has been a jam-packed season for super moons, uh, but it's a perfect evening for viewing. And uh, even if you get up early in the morning and watch it before the sun comes up, looking pretty good the next couple of days. Let me start you off with your temperature trend because things are changing. Last time we checked in, it was just an upward chat trend, but we do have some dips now in the forecast. Uh, another nice one tomorrow. As we head into the end of the week though, notice that we come back down to still just above our seasonal mark. This is the weekend. And then we start to rise again early next week. So getting some fluctuations as we get out of this high pressure ridge, but uh, no major return to February weather or anything like that. Uh, taking you through the forecast through the overnight into tomorrow morning, not much to speak of in the way of clouds, perfect super moon viewing. But as we head into Thursday evening, notice the high clouds sneaking in from west to east. I think any precip though should hold off until Friday morning. Watch as I keep this going. Early Friday morning, some uh, drizzle. And then the main event, which isn't a soaker, but the heavier showers to arrive Friday overnight into Saturday. Another nice one across the province tomorrow though. Almost everyone sharing in the sunshine and the above seasonal temperatures. I think we'll be breaking records yet again across the province. This high pressure system is shifting eastward though and that's what's allowing this little Pacific system to slide in. There's not much to it. Here are those early showers Friday morning and then here are the showers Friday night into Saturday morning. It'll bring some showers to the coastal areas of BC and the interior but not everyone getting into this system kind of dissipates as it moves inland. Another check on where that warm air is going. It's sliding eastward and southward, uh, but then we start to see high pressure redevelop in through early next week, which is why we have another little blip of above seasonal temperatures in that trend we were looking at. Uh, and, and generally these are seasonal colors, nothing to worry about as I take you through the long, long range forecast. Uh, temperatures, well, record breaking tomorrow. That's a bit of a cool down, but it certainly beats the uh, single digits we were dealing with over the past couple of weeks. Mm. So a little return and a little blip. And you know what? Uh, anytime we see sort of more than four or five days of uh, sunshine, start thinking about needing the rain. You know, we're watching some sporadic wildfires and sure. getting into the, the uh, flooding season. Not mm. a bad idea to mm. uh, kick off our week with some rain. And a little rain for the uh, flowers that have started to pop up, you know? Look at you. Not a bad thing. I'm thinking of, every yeah. thinking of everything. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Joe. You're welcome. Well, New Zealand is honoring its dead. We're going to take you to Christchurch, where the city's residents are turning out to pay respects.
The investigation into last week's deadly shooting rampage in New Zealand continues tonight, but most people there are focusing on the victims and their families. Funerals have begun, and as the CBC's Briar Stewart discovered, the services are helping the country grieve and heal. <laughs> During the haka ritual, the Maori believe the whole body should speak and convey a message, and this is one of loss, but also of strength and resolve. <laughs> Even members of rival biker gangs turned up to take part alongside hundreds of others in a tribute to the victims. It was as if it happened to them, like as if their loved ones had died, and you know, we're all just one big family, and it really came out today. Maha Almadani's father, 66-year-old Ali, was killed in the shootings at Al Noor along with several family friends. The family is from Jordan originally and they moved to New Zealand 22 years ago. He really loved New Zealand. Yeah. He really considered it home. And yeah, my husband decided to come here because it's a uh, safe place for the girls and for my son. The family is still waiting for police to release Amadani's body. Some funeral services have already been held and more are expected soon. The hope is that both mosques that were attacked can be reopened in time for Friday prayers. The Prime Minister has also called for two minutes of silence across New Zealand. Jacinda Ardern says all countries need to be concerned about the rise of racist nationalism. Yes, this was an Australian citizen, but that is not to say that we do not have ideology in New Zealand that would be a front to the majority of New Zealanders. We still have a responsibility to weed it out where it exists. Now there's an effort to protect those left shaken and feeling vulnerable. As a group prays, a line of people stand behind them, symbolically watching their backs. It's a country looking inward searching for a way forward in the midst of so much grief. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Christchurch. Three days of national mourning have begun in Mozambique for more than 200 people killed by Cyclone E-Day. That number is expected to grow. Thousands of people are still stranded by rising floodwaters. And as Kyle Hounsel reports tonight, aid groups are struggling to get help to many more left homeless. This might look like the sea, but it's 24 kilometers from the coast. People are camping on roofs, several hundred taking shelter in the stands of a stadium. This view from above provides a clearer picture of Cyclone E-Day's destruction below. This situation is very, very serious. Uh, it's, uh, it's a trouble. I, mean, yeah, I can say that uh, we are in trouble. Yes, this is a dangerous situation because uh, the people are dying because of this flood. And aid organizations are now racing to save them. Helicopters often the only way to get to them. This helicopter is equipped with a winch, which is crucial for the rescue operation that uh, is currently underway with the South African Air Force. And we are hoping to boost the rescue capability with this helicopter. The World Food Program stepped up its food distribution today but it is still not fast enough. Help, we're suffering here. Help Mozambique. Mozambique has declared its first ever national state of emergency. And as people struggle to find food, water and shelter, there is a growing concern the floods have brought waterborne illnesses such as cholera. And not just in Mozambique, neighboring Malawi and Zimbabwe have been hit too. More than the, the infrastructure we are concerned about right now is to get to help the communities, to help individuals. Zimbabwe's military is leading operations to rebuild roads so aid can get into the disaster zone. And there is no relief in sight. The coming days are expected to bring more heavy rains. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, London. The Brexit countdown clock is now down to just nine days, but there's still no plan in place for Britain to leave the European Union. Today, Prime Minister Theresa May asked the EU for a three-month extension in another attempt to win support for the exit deal she has negotiated. A deal that delivers on the result of the referendum and is the very best deal negotiable. 
and I will continue to work night and day to secure the support of my colleagues, the DUP and others for this deal. But I am not prepared to delay Brexit any further than the 30th of June. The EU would prefer Britain either leave by May 23rd before European parliamentary elections or stay until at least the end of the year, which would force Britain to take part in those elections. EU leaders are expected to talk about it tomorrow in Brussels. Meanwhile, in Europe, the continent watches with a mix of curiosity and concern. The CBC's Thomas Degla has a look at what the rest of Europe thinks of Brexit. Brexit sure is a political maze, a series of twists and turns with a way out somehow. But as you go deeper, the exit only appears further. This is the spot where three countries meet, the Netherlands, Germany and Belgium. There are no borders and that's common across Europe, a reflection of EU integration and a reminder of how many Europeans find it hard to understand why Britain would want to leave. <laughs> Nearby in Aachen, Germany, history weighs heavy. The Second World War destroyed much of this city, so people here value European unity over division. It's a quite stupid process from, from the people of the UK to decide to do the Brexit. Um, I think it's really a pity for Europe. Britain belongs to Europe from my point of view, and the economy is a very important thing. And there's no sugarcoating the impact on European business. Welcome to Lambert's, making sweet treats since 1688. Just on this one line, they're churning out 15 tons of cookies a day, exporting around the world, including to Britain, at least for now. Country and such a big one. Herman Bullbecker's family has owned Lambert's for centuries. Their cookies are so famous, they're given as gifts, symbols of Germany. We might have uh, big problems with customs, duties. The products uh, might be more expensive. Why is Great Britain doing such a kind of suicide? A question now posed across Europe, with many nations that considered following Britain out the door now rethinking their plans. In those countries where populist parties have talked about this, uh, it has become very unpopular since the Brexit process has become such a disaster. Yes, it's not all bad here. Ironically, Brexit has somehow bolstered European unity. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Aachen, Germany. New details tonight about two deadly crashes involving the Boeing 737 MAX 8. Those planes, of course, have been grounded while investigators figure out what happened. CBC's Johanna Wagstaff is back with us, a pilot herself. Uh, you've been following this story uh, very closely. I think we talk about it uh, almost every day, the mm -hmm. two of us. So what are we learning tonight? Well, Mike, the new details have to do with the first crash, the Indonesia Lion Air crash that killed 189 people back in October. We're learning information from the Indonesia Transportation Safety Board who have analyzed the cockpit voice recorder and learning more about those final moments between the crew. So here's what we now know, that in those final seconds, the pilot handed over control to his co-pilot and flipped through the pages of a technical manual trying to figure out what was happening with the plane. Looking for answers, interestingly, connected to speed and altitude, which is what the previous crew had reported, never suggesting there was any problem with this MCAS system or the trim system, which we now know was part of the problem. Then as the nose of the plane repeatedly bucked downward in a cycle that ended up repeating 20 times, uh, the co-pilot began to pray. Up until that point, uh, the pilot sounded in control and calm. So this is new information that we're getting. It was not released in a preliminary uh, report back in November, and that's because that report was based on flight data recorder, not the cockpit reporter. Uh, authorities say the official report won't be released until July or August. But we're also learning more about the flight 
before that Lion Air. Uh, same plane, the doomed plane, but different crew. And sources to Reuters say there may have been a third pilot uh, sort of hitching a ride in the cockpit that helped them disable this system and ultimately uh, save the plane after they reported uh, problems with the uh, airspeed. Uh, so a lot of questions about why that information didn't get passed on to the second crew, the ultimately uh, a doomed crew. And again, this third pilot uh, has not been uh, mentioned in any of the early reports. So we wait for that final conclusion in the next couple of months, Mike. All right. And uh, more questions also about how the 737 MAX was certified by the FAA in the first place. That's right. So Canada, Transport Canada and the European agencies have now said that we would like to review this Boeing patch that they are working on rolling out to their global fleet. Uh, normally, we just take uh, the certifications uh, cross border. Uh, but in this case, Transport Canada said we would like to double check that patch before we roll our planes back out into the skies. Uh, the Transportation Department's Inspector General in the U.S. is also conducting a review of how this plane was certified to fly and a grand jury under the U.S. Justice Department also seeking records in a possible criminal probe. And we're now hearing today that the FBI will be involved in this uh, investigation. So things escalating uh, very quickly. And uh, as we wait for this patch to be rolled out, again, agencies around the world questioning how the Boeing 737 MAX 8s and 9s were certified in the first place. Appreciate the update. Thanks, Joe. You're welcome. Well, Major League Baseball is back. It kicked off across the water in Japan, where a national hero got a very warm welcome. That's uh, Ichiro Suzuki becoming the second oldest position player to start an opening game. Packed crowd of 45,787 on hand to see what's likely one of the 45-year-old's final games. Of course, he's playing for the Seattle Mariners. Several of the players in this game weren't even born when Ichiro began his pro career back in 1992. Well, family food, new beginnings coming up, celebrating Persian New Year.
Well, thousands of families took a moment today to ring in Persian New Year. Yes, No Ruse is a month-long celebration centered on family, food, and new beginnings. Our only Ann Young joined one family in West Vancouver as they mark the occasion. So, uh, Matsi, we're here in the uh, Phil Swift family home, and we just saw everybody, including you and your daughter, celebrate New Ruse. How was that? Oh, it was great. It's such a joyful occasion, as you can see. Yes, and so we're all gathered around the half scene. So this table is ceremonial, and there's uh, many different items on here, but they all symbolize something. In ancient times, they actually represented the first seven creations. Water, earth, sky, plant, animals, uh, fire and also he humans and the uh, holy fire. But today, it has got a different meaning. Half seen it actually means, uh, re refers to seven objects uh, starting with the letter S, the Persian letter S. Mm -hmm. And what it means, health, all the, these, these two basically the means apples health. The yeah, apple and garlic mean, means health. A coin means prosperity. Egg means fertility. This wheat paste means fertility. Uh, the wheat grass means uh, fresh growth. And you tell me that families grow this right before they, the new they year, they actually. They grow it before the new year. They make that before the new year as well. And basically, it's all about uh, paying tribute to elements of nature, flowers, plants, animals, and uh, p health and prosperity, and a sweet life in the coming year. We always eat sweets right after Norus. And I also saw that the kids were uh, getting money out of the they book get, of poetry. Get, yeah, that's right. Uh, they, it should be new money, and it's their gifts. Gifts are exchanged normally just to the kids, and it will be fresh money. Again, it has to be new, fresh money. It's all about renewal. Yeah, all about okay, renewal. Okay, well, thank you so much for sharing with us today, Mr. May. You're very welcome. Happy Nooruz. Same to you. Nooruz, Piruz. Nice big celebration. I know. There's New Year, spring. Yeah. Super, super, super worm, moon. Super, super blood worm moon. Sure. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. Trust you. <laughs> you know what? It is going to be a great night. I, 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 somebody today in the newsroom said they have been uh, super mooned out. Oh. But this is our last one of 2019. So in about 10 minutes, mm -hmm. look towards the horizon and you'll see, uh, you'll see the red guy rising. And even in the morning hours before mm -hmm. the sun fully comes up, Beautiful shots. Had some early pictures this morning, so I'll be uh, I'll be watching on Twitter and Instagram. Yeah, I'm sure there'll be lots of stuff there yep. for sure. All right. Yep. Thanks for watching tonight. You can always find our news program online at cbc.ca/bc. Dan is here at 11, right after the national. Have a good night. Good night.